Good afternoon. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. Hi, everyone. My name is Teresa Soto. I'm Assistant Director of Academic Programs here at the Hammer. And it's my great pleasure to kick off today's event. Before we begin, I just wanted to share a reminder for you to please silence your cell phones if you haven't already. And, um, and if you had brought any food or drink, food or drink is not allowed in the theater, so sorry about that. So first of all, I just want to begin with a huge, huge appreciation for Las Fotos Project. They've been an incredible collaborators on this project, and it's been so much fun to work with them to get to know their work and the inspiring, um, all of the inspiring projects that they do with teens. So let's, first of all, a huge round of applause for Las Fotos Project, please. Okay, and um, how many have been, have been to the Hammer Museum before? Okay, about half of you. So for those of you who are returning, welcome back. Um, our exhibitions change approximately every four months, so there's always something, to new, something new to see here. And if you were here just a few months ago, then chances are that when you go into our galleries today, you'll be surprised by something incredibly new, which we'll share a little bit about today. Um, for those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. This is our mission. The Hammer Museum believes in the promise of art and ideas to illuminate our lives and build a more just world. So it's a mission that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, it is uh, such an important way to bring all of us together in the institution and all of our partners and all the audiences that we serve. Social justice, um, inclusion, equity, these are driving um, aims for all of us and it makes us so uh, excited to come to work every day and it is at the heart of all that we do in our exhibitions and in over 300 programs that we have here at the Hammer. It is why we're free, so I hope that you come back again and again. We are free for good here at the Hammer Museum. We're a museum that's known for contemporary art, the art and ideas of our time, and our current exhibition, Radical Women, Latin American Art, 1960 to 1985, is a perfect example of this mission. This is an exhibition that is a landmark show that highlights the artistic contributions of underrecognized Latina, Chicana, and Latin American women to contemporary art. This exhibition has been incredibly inspiring to me personally because um, it is really showcasing the work of artists of, who are women, and who are women of color predominantly. And for me, growing up as a woman of color, I didn't really have a lot of role models of, of women artists of color. And to see an exhibition highlighted here as part of the Getty's Pacific Standard Time Initiative has been uh, such a joy to work with and to experience uh, on my own as I walk through the galleries. And I hope you some, spend some time at the end of our event today to go into the ex exhibition and experience it for yourself. It's very powerful. We have uh, over 120 artists and collectives from 15 different countries represented in this exhibition. And it is a show that is making visible the work of artists who have been predominantly left out or invisible from the, the patriarchal art historical canon. So these are women artists who have been making great work and really haven't had a vehicle, a venue, um, the, the support in order to make it uh, visible to an international scene. And now, because of the hammer and the good works of our curators, the co-curators who are Andrea Junta and Cecilia Fajardo-Hill, um, we are able to have this vehicle now for these artists, which is incredible. So many of the works in the exhibition have rarely, if ever, been seen in Los Angeles, and yet LA is now the largest Latin American city outside of Latin America. So it really is a good time for us to experience it. Um, and I just wanted to also mention that is a particularly timely moment in our history, in our current history, to have this exhibition, to have this event. Um, it's been a really kind of shocking and sad um, in the news the past couple of weeks in terms of the assault on female bodies. And so here we are at a, at a day where we're celebrating uh, women, we're celebrating girls, we're celebrating female identifying teens. And I am just so privileged to be up here today to share this with you. And with that, I would love to turn it over to our moderator, who's going to really run the show. 
Melissa Barales Lopez is a senior attending Garfield High School. Born and raised in East Los Angeles, Melissa spends her time reading, writing, and watching an inordinate amount of law and order. A social justice warrior at heart, she utilizes photography to highlight several issues taking place in her neighborhood. Melissa shares a passion for public policy and legislation and would love to pursue a career in either field. Melissa. Hello, my name is Melissa and I am a senior attending Garfield High School. I will be hosting and moderating today's panel. I joined Las Votas Project last year where I participated in the Esta Soy Yo and Digital Promotoras program. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Las Votas Project, we are a photography mentorship organization for teenage girls. Our mission is to inspire girls and to elevate their voices through photography. Now, we offer year-round programming in partnership with other schools and community-based organizations. Our programs focus on storytelling, self-identity, advocacy, and mental wellness. We go on field trips to museums and galleries all over Los Angeles. We bring in guest speakers and host workshops that teach us new photography skills and teach our girls how to be creative. We become invested in our community and in advocating for it. We meet girls with the same interests and we learn how to connect with them, with our peers, with our families, and most important, with our community. With that said, I want to welcome everyone to the panel for Radical Girls. Now it is my honor to introduce our featured speaker, artist Judy Vaca. Judy Vaca is a painter, a muralist, a monument builder, a scholar, and activist. Vaca founded the first City of Los Angeles mural program in 1974, which evolved into the Social and Public Art Resource Center, or SPARC, a community arts organization that has been creating sites of public memory since 1976. Vaca's public arts initiatives reflect the lives and concerns of historically disenfranchised populations. She conceived the Great Wall of Los Angeles, which employed over 400 at-risk youth and their families to work alongside artists and scholars. The Great Wall depicts a mile-long multicultural history of California from prehistory all the way into the 1950s. Vaca's artworks are as much about the process of how art is made as they are about the end results. She has been teaching art at the UC system since 1984, and her work is currently displayed here at our um, exhibit. Now, please give a warm and big round of applause for Judy. Thank you, I want to say thank you to Melissa for that lovely introduction and for talking about uh, the work that she is doing, and she provides me with a hope for the future uh, of what young women will be doing in the future. Um, I wanted to today to, to do a presentation that I call Absolutely Chicana. Because there's a question, of course, what is a Chicana and who are Chicanos? And I think actually this work uh, today that I'm going to show you is about the evolution of an identity. Uh, myself as a young woman and uh, 18 and 19 years old trying to determine who would I who I would become and so uh, in the radical women's show I have a piece called Las Tres Marias and I hope that if you haven't been through the exhibition you will go through and enter one of the, uh, the salons where you will see um, the Tres Marias standing in front of you and in the middle is a mirror we'll, we'll take a look at that image and I hope that you will take a selfie and send it to me, because the Tres Marias, the third Maria, is you. Um, when I was about 19 or 20 years old, I painted this painting. And I thought I would show it to you, because it was one of the earliest pieces that I did that was really thinking about who I was. And I was raised in a household with my, my two, two tias and my abuelita, who took care of me while my mother worked in the factory. And so I had a kind of matriarchal household of very powerful women. My grandmother was a healer. Um, she practiced um, uh, healing with hierbas and prayer and, um, and kind of the study of your dreams. And so I lived in a magical reality. And in this image, this is me as a 20-year-old 
uh, with my mother in the foreground and my first communion image. And the connection between my grandmother and I is clearly evident in this painting. Um, it's currently in an exhibition in which it's never been shown before um, at CSUN. And if you have an opportunity to get to the California State University at Northridge, I hope you'll see my one woman show there, which is about uh, my 40 years of work as a public artist. This mural is a mural that I did, the very earliest mural that I did. And you'll see me there as a young woman sitting in front of a piece called Mi Abuelita. It was painted in Hollenbeck Park in about 1970. And it was um, a very kind of crude image, but um, an image that um, essentially was in a band shell. And what we were doing was making um, a plan for young people who danced in the, the Feria de los Niños uh, to dance in the arms of a grandmother. Part of this was um, my work in, the, in East Los Angeles between neighborhoods and bringing young people from different neighborhoods together to become a group that we called Las Vistas Nuevas. Las Vistas Nuevas was composed of people who were identified as gang members, people, but essentially they were just simply from different neighborhoods. But the neighborhoods didn't get along. So we initiated a peace treaty. I, I developed a plan uh, to work with the different people from the neighborhood, different guys from the neighborhood, and create a kind of treaty between them so we could paint Mi Abuelita. This is actually another very early mural, and you'll see something very much in common in this early work of mine. My struggle to try and figure out who we were as women in our community and in our culture. And this is a place called Wabash Recreation Center. This is a Medusa head. And you see me on the scaffolding looking kind of like Joan Baez with a headband. Uh, and I'm, uh, I've been asked to come to this neighborhood by the, the boys from White Fence, um, also known as Cerco Blanco. Uh, and they've called the mayor's office because now the newspaper has written about my work and they're saying, could we have the mural lady here? And so I went to work with this group of young people, and you can see them on the scaffolding. And we painted this piece uh, that was a, a Medusa head that went into the overhang of, uh, of uh, Wabash Recreation Center. The, the problem at Wabash was that the young people were tearing out the doors to the, the front of the center over and over again. They said it was a very violent and terrible place and uh, maybe you could work with these kids and do something with it. And so we started to paint the doors. We painted the doors with a Medusa head and you can see the, the hair uh, turning into these vines that went into the ceiling. And uh, what was happening uh, was that there was not just simple violence, but the fact that this, the only basketball court for miles was locked up at night so the kids couldn't get into it. So I became something of a miracle worker by simply getting the gym opened at night and painting this image on the front of the doors. For like uh, almost 30 years, this image was the symbol of Wabash Recreation Center, and it was the second piece of Las Vistas Nuevas. As part of my work with young people, uh, I went back to my own neighborhood. I was born in Watts, and I grew up in a place called Pacoima. And Pacoima is probably most well known for the film uh, La Bamba uh, that, that um, uh, Luis Valdez, one of our great Chicano artists, made uh, about Richie Valens. I went to school with Richie Valens. I went to school with Chich Marin. We were all from Pacoima. And these young girls are also from Pacoima. And this is a photograph taken in about uh, the early 1970s when I was working with them uh, to do a piece that later became part of an exhibition at the Women's Building. Las Tres Marias that's in this exhibition is from that particular time. Uh, these are all sisters uh, from a group called the Tiny Locas. And actually they, were, uh, they lived in the same neighborhood and they were all, most of them related. And we took these kind of amazing portraits of these young women who went with me to paint this um, uh, corazón image uh, that is called Mi Barrio Pacoima. And this is what backed up the Tres Marias image that's in the current exhibition. You'll see in the foreground um, a mirror, uh, and it is actually me. In that mirror, 
is an image of me transforming myself into the pachuca that is in this exhibition. Las Venas de la Mujer was about the idea of looking at all the different roles of women. What were the avenues that women took uh, in our communities? And so here is, look, we looked at our parents and we looked at our grandparents. What was the work that they were doing? Some of them were working in sewing factories. Um, here you can see a piece by Josefina Quesada, who was here from Mexico and produced this installation. Um, here is another one by uh, Isabel Castro, who's also in this exhibition, Radical Women. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can see her producing these revolutionary posters, and, and she will become a revolutionary. And I will become the Pachuca. This is um, a series of photographs taken of me uh, for the studies that are very rarely seen uh, of me acting out um, the woman that will become the Pachuca and the Tres Marias in this exhibition. You'll see me standing alongside of uh, Flaca, who is also from Pacoima, but she is, Flaca is 20 years later. Uh, the Pachuca is a kind of 1950s, 40s and 50s image, and she is a very um, strong and powerful and scary woman in the sense that she was not a person that you could mess with. And I was looking at the the facades of, of what these faces were and the kind of facade that had to be put on so that a woman could have agency, so she could stand up against uh, the men in our communities, against the assaults, the kinds of things that occurred, and against the racism that we experienced at that time, and particularly in the 1940s. Uh, the 1940s was the time of the Zoot Suit riots in Los Angeles, in which people dressed like this and young men dressed in Zoot Suits uh, could be stripped and beaten and left on the streets. And June 7th, 1943 is one of those historic moments uh, in Los Angeles. The, the uh, outside of the um, uh, Tres Marias installation is tuck and roll. It's the way that the cars were done for the lowrider cars in, in our neighborhood. And uh, so it's a velvet. And my, my father actually made that uh, for us for me in, the, in, the, in this installation. And again, you can see the mirror in the center. The piece um, uh, was shown in the women's building, and then it became part of the, the Gara exhibition, which was this um, uh, Chicano art resistance and affirmation uh, about 20 years later. And now as part of the Smithsonian uh, um, Latino Treasures uh, collection. And it was loaned to uh, the Hammer Museum for this exhibition. <clears throat> More recently, I produced a work um, that's called Absolutely Chicana, and this is a, a, a seriograph image of the same figure, because the figure is sort of timeless, and uh, she has meaning beyond the time that she was produced. I, I went to the exhibition dressed as the Pachuca. Everybody was kind of amazed that it was me. They couldn't tell that it was me, and I was actually imitating my cousin, because my mother was very strict and would not let me shave my eyebrows or wrap my hair up at this way, in this way. And I, uh, I, I really enjoyed putting on this persona and becoming a completely different person. The counterpart, of course, to Flaca and to the contemporary uh, times that I was working in the, um, at Wabash was a time in which there was uh, fighting within the neighborhoods and there were young people who lost their lives because of territories. And this is, um, this is Toro from White Fence. Uh, you see uh, on the side of the curb, he's 17 years old, and he's um, shot, just executed, because he's in the wrong territory. He's gone into the wrong territory. He was one of the painters and my crew uh, at the Wabash Recreation Center that you saw, and we lost him at 17 years old. And it was very traumatic and upsetting for all of us, and uh, I painted this with wood stain on newsprint uh, and kind of... Um, um, response, emotional response, to the loss of this uh, young man. I still kept trying to figure out what was the role, who were we as women, and who were we in relationship to these young men. This, this character is, you see the facades dropping off her face. It's actually uh, was meant to be a portrait of my sister, but in a sense it is a kind of image of the mestizaje, the mixture of the the indigenous person and the Spanish who becomes the third race. And so this is uh, um, 
an image about that particular identity, the, the Chicana, the Mexicana, the Mexica. And below it, you see two eyes hanging from her neck, and those are that's the Milagro, uh, the Milagro, uh, which is the um, Milagro for eyes. And this little spiritual um, pendulant is about keeping your eyes open and being able to see. I worked also, I keep working with images that are about women. They're central in my thought. Um, this is a sleeping uh, Mexican image. You've probably seen these uh, uh, kind of ceramic pieces all across the border. And they're kind of offensive in the sense that this Mexican figure, which is often bought and put into people's gardens, um, it's used kind of like a black sambo image, is a faceless Mexican. And very often there's a tequila bottle alongside of him or a cactus, kind of indicating that he's either drunk or he's lazy, he's having a siesta. And I began to take these pieces and intervene in them and begin to try and create other meaning for these uh, kitsch objects that are um, in fact degrading. Where is his face? Um, is he really sleeping or drunk? Um, he was, uh, he belied everything I knew about the hardworking uh, people that I knew in my family and in my neighborhood. So in this image, I worked uh, to create an image called the Hijas de Juarez. And this is about the women who, were, who are continually being lost in Juarez, uh, who, whose bodies are showing up in the desert. And these are portraits of these young women. Um, uh, they're painted on the sides of the, of the, uh, the, the pancho. And on the uh, top, you'll see a woman, uh, kind of woman who looks kind of like a crucifix. And these are uh, portraits of the women who have been murdered and their bodies make up the toes of the figures. And on the front is a, is a kind of poetic statement saying, who pays for this? Who's responsible for this? Predators? It's in a sense, our voices speaking back to the loss of these women. And as a meditation, I created these little figures on the back like a spine of the women who were lost. So Pancho has become a precious object that is in commemoration of the women lost in Juarez. In about 1977, I went to Mexico to study muralism. I learned of the great work, uh, even though I had a degree in art, uh, by that point, a master's degree in art, I had never seen the Mexican muralists because all of our teachings was really about European art, not about looking to the north or looking to the south. And yet there was a tradition of muralism that was so amazing. In the 20th century, probably the greatest muralists that ever lived were from Mexico City and from the, uh, the uh, territories of Mexico. And this group was called Las Tres Grandes. Los Tres Grandes uh, it was, it was uh, Diego Rivera, Jose Clemente Orozco, and David Alfaro Siqueiros. Siqueiros was conducting a workshop, and I signed up to go. Little did I know that I was going to be the only woman in a workshop of 26 men. Muralism, apparently, was the, pure, the, the, the purview of men only. So here is a mural that I produced in that workshop. And it was in response to the men who were painting images of women that were really, I thought, demeaning. The bullets across the chest of the Adalitas in which they were bare-breasted. You've seen these images in the calendars. You've seen them in, your, in the restaurants. Uh, and Mexican re restaurants. And I was thinking, what is the opposite of that? What was the women, what were the women like in my family, the women that I knew? And so I created this spiritual leader, this woman who literally flies, whose foot is partially in touch with the other life, as you can see right to her, to her bones. And all these women are rising up out of the fields. Men in the background are carrying the babies. And, and on the left-hand side, the whole neighborhood is lit up in the light of a helicopter from the police. This was the reality that I understood and knew. And I also, a completely different vision than my male counterparts were making. I mean, you also notice something. This was a point in which the police began their new policing policy uh, in talking about social justice in which um, they marked the tops of the projects. This is actually the housing project. 
and the, the vegetation was cut down so they could identify places more readily with the numbers on the roof. And it says, mi barrio, no, aquí no controlan, because the boys would write, aquí controlan, but in truth, you didn't have control there. And in fact, more and more money was moving from the quality of life to an education, to police enforcement, and to the military. So these were male ideas, and I was trying to counter with female ideas. What, what is a woman's idea? This is the work in progress. Uh, this is me after the short, uh, shortly after the completion of the work with the figure that is maybe not a portrait of my grandmother, but clearly the spirit of Francisca. Probably the longest um, a commitment that I have made in my life to anything was the production of this of work called The Great Wall of LA. It was painted with over 400 adolescents. And I just do a very quick and brief history of a mural that became a half a mile long mural. This is the Los Angeles River. It's probably what it looked like in the early days of the founding of Los Angeles. This is a woman who is a Tangva woman, uh, un unknown in terms of who her, what her name was. I found her in the archives of USC. And this image um, of this incredibly haunting and beautiful woman it was unnamed, anonymous, it said, anonymous woman. Uh, she lived probably along the banks of the river, as I did in Pacoima. I was near the river, and I saw the river turning to concrete in the largest public works project in America. In the 1920s, a flood occurred, a major flood occurred, as it often did. The river expanded and contracted in the seasons. And when it expanded in one rainy season, it flooded the downtown region. And it was still a pueblo in that sense, and it was not a really big town. But the Army Corps of Engineers and the city fathers, and I say fathers, made this decision that the river had to be tamed. The river had to be controlled. And it was a power over the natural environment, not a concern or an interest of working with what was Mother Earth, uh, and more uh, uh, with a thought that was perhaps a more female sensibility, but the river became a hardened artery. That artery became um, a, a method of bringing the water to the ocean more quickly, created pollutants in the Santa Monica Bay, created divisions within communities. And it was standing alongside of that river in 1974 when the Army Corps of Engineers asked me to paint in this region to somehow work to beautify it after they completed the project in the 70s. So it was nearly 50 years. Every river, every arroyo within the city of Los Angeles was concreted. So here we are at this point seeing the river uh, as a completed concrete river. It's turning here uh, to the tattoo on the scar where the river once ran. You can see this, uh, the, the, the tattoo coming across the river. We will work on this for many summers, over five summers. 400 people will paint a narrative that will discover the real story of Los Angeles. And this real story will be unfolded in this narrative work. This is actually a piece on Chavez Ravine. Um, you see the Dodger Stadium coming into the oldest Mexican part of the city of Los Angeles. Here you see in the 1930s the massive deportations that occurred in Los Angeles in which are now actually the newest numbers are something like 500,000 people were deported from the Southwest back to Mexico in 1933 in what was called the Repatriation Act. And the officers hurl back alien horde was exactly from the cover of the newspaper uh, in the, at that time. The Chinese building the railroad, all the stories that are unknown were, were put together in the painting of this work uh, by a 400 young people. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to hear the voice of these young people who not only worked on the creation of this imagery, but at your ages, at your, in your time, high school and junior high, they were able to work with me to work across their racial differences, to begin to understand each other. Who I thought you were is an exercise saying, oh, I thought you were really rough and you were mean and I really didn't like you. And this is actually us working out those differences. And this is Ernestine uh, coming up here. These are some of the exercises that we did to work together. Um, a lot of it was play and fun. 
as we painted 2,740 feet, summer after summer. This is Ernestine Jimenez, almost 30 years after she worked on it. The way I grew up is, it. you know, you fight through life. Very short film. You know, I've got 10 brothers and six sisters, and I'm the baby. And it was a fight in my house all the time. And that's the way I believed you were supposed to have grown up, to fight through life. Don't like nobody but your own race. And even sometimes don't even like your own race. There was a lot of tension. Um, I think everybody wanted to fight everybody, just the way they looked, or the way they looked at them, or the way they dressed. And after time, you just started get, getting to know that person as an individual instead of knowing them as you were taught to, you know? And everybody became very good friends, so. It took a lot, a lot of growing up. I'm not saying that first year did it, because it didn't. It took a lot of growing up. But I made a lot of friends through the four years, and every year I understood something else, every year. This is your with your son? I wouldn't son. have went back to high school, because I wouldn't have had a role model to push me to go there. Education was... Judy's number one thing. As long as I stood in school, you can come back and paint the mural. And that's what, even though I got in trouble in school and fought and everything, that was my number one goal. I wanted to come back. I had to come back. What really kind of freaked me out, though, is when I met the people that, when we painted the mural of the Holocaust, and I met the people that had the tattoos on them, that kind of blew my mind. That actually, that made me cry. Because I know there was another world that was harder than mine. And I just really felt for it. This mural opened my eyes so much. Even when I'm down and out, I still this walk by here. At the time of the and I think God, I, I did accomplish something in life. And it makes me feel good. And I think if it wasn't for this mural, for me to have my name on it and to have accomplished something, I don't know where I'd be. Well, I'm gonna probably conclude here with the story, a very quick story uh, of my family's um, migration into the United States and the work that we do in the Digital Mural Lab it's a UCLA at Spark Digital Mural Lab, um, a facility that is off campus where I teach for UCLA for World Arts and Cultures and Chicano Studies. And the piece is called La Memoria de Nuestra Tierra, and it's about the land and memory. This is my grandmother, Francisca. Um, it's a photograph I took as a young photographer in a phot photography class. And it, this is probably the reason that I am an artist, because of Francisca. And it is her story. And this was the first time I had the opportunity to tell the story of my own family. This is Denver International Airport, so if you fly through Denver and you're in the central terminal and you're waiting for security, you'll be standing in front of the story of my own family. And it's a 50-foot mural. It's both painted and digitally generated. And what was interesting was I was beginning to look at the possibility of using technology to generate the imagery. And you can see here uh, the landscape. And into the landscape are figures that became part of the story of this whole region outside of Denver, where my mother was born because of the, tran the, the transit of my family from Mexico during the Mexican Revolution. This is a, a Chihuahuan miner on the, uh, on the left. That's Corky Gonzalez and Cesar Chavez bringing the great bo boycott to Colorado. There's a Cheyenne woman in the foreground and my grandfather, who I found in the railroad um, museum, uh, facing outward uh, in my research to produce this work. This is what they might have looked like making the crossing as they're walking on water in a magical crossing. Not the kind of image of like cucarachas scattering from a truck being uh, sought after by helicopters um, or the um, the migra, but in a sense, as they walk, they come into the southwest, 
that they are actually making a miraculous tra travel and changing tremendously that region. These are the stories of that region embedded in the land as if it's coming up out of the land. And the trick here is learning essentially, which I think is what I've been doing for the last 40 years in my work, is learning to listen to the ground, listen to the land, and see if I can find the stories recorded there. This is my grandfather, uh, Theodoro, and his choice was to go work in the mines or to work in the railroads or to work in the fields. Um, part of the story is the recovery of my family's graves, uh, because at that time, just as in the South, Mexican graves were abandoned and not kept up. And so in this little town called La Junta, which was the junction of the Santa Fe Railroad, my grandfather's grave was lost, as were all my family members. And part of the recovery and the making of this work was the recovery of these graves. And this is a moment in which my whole family has come together, including my Navajo uh, aunt, because we intermarried between the native people and, my, and, the, and the Mexican people and my mother in the fuchsia jacket and with her sister as we recover my grandfather's grave. Again, um, this story continues into Los Angeles with the recovery of, of, of stories and telling the stories of uh, people in the Miguel Contreras Learning Center. Here, uh, my students work with the high school students to record what their lives were like and to create a series uh, to talk about these experiences. You know, I live in a single room apartment with two families, each with five people. This does not allow for me to have any privacy. And my head hurts, you know, and everyone is screaming uh, and I, I get frustrated. That's why I want to go to college and be able to get my own place. So this is our, and let's see, this is our imagery created called La Gente de Maiz. And um, this uh, image is uh, the figure in the center is Karina, who graduated from Miguel Contreras, and this is the Pico Union region. So the work is able to tell the stories, both digitally created, some of these are photographic images, and some of it is painted images painted on screen. So with that, I will leave you and um, uh, end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. Uh, Judy is now being joined by a panel of four very talented artists and image makers who are here to discuss their experiences as women in the arts. Our panelists come from diverse backgrounds and they use different forms of art to express who they are and what they care about. Our first artist, Star Montana, was born and raised in Boyle Heights, which serves as an important backdrop to her artistic practice. Her photo-based work investigates class, family, and self-identity. For her collaborative long-term project, Three Dots and Teardrops, the artist worked with her family to explore themes of fragmented histories, loss, and hope. This project was on view at the Vincent Price Art Museum and the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center. More recently, she has expanded her practice to work with a large scope of Los Angeles residents via portraiture and video. Please welcome Star. Hi. Trying to get to my slideshow. <laughs> One second. Uh, I don't think so. Hi, can I get my slideshow? <laughs> there, there. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Star Montana, and so I like to introduce my work. I dream of Los Angeles. So this is. Um, my latest project, and this work w has been about four years in the making. Um, so a little of the background before I kind of go through the images, even though I got about three minutes, so it'll be very quickly, um, was I was born and raised in Boyle Heights. Um, a lot of my work, I had been working with my family, and then I went away to school in New York, 
And so I'm of Mexican American descent. I'm fourth generation on my mom's side, and then I am first generation on my father's side, but I wasn't raised with him, so it's mostly a fourth generation experience. Um, so I had really never questioned identity until I went away to New York. Um, and then, I mean, I had started to, I, I went to East LA College, but you know, so you learn about Chicano history if you want to and all these other things. And I was very privileged to be able to take these classes. But then when I went and I started uh, pursuing my education in New York, I got these really racist and classist um, art history where they didn't really necessarily want to teach you about anything and the other, you know? So it was a very Western, uh, white, you know, in the ph photography context, it's gonna be a privileged, white, um, dominant, you know, point of view. And so when I would uh, reference, you know, photographers that didn't fit that canon, uh, they were just like, uh, we don't know who you're talking about, or like the West. And so also when referencing my community, it would always be like basically this ideology of like mug shots, you know. And so when I wanted to pursue a project with my community. I was a documentary photographer, and then I decided, no, I, I'm gonna learn portraiture. And not only that, I'm gonna learn portraiture in a formal aspect, because I want to photograph my community in the way of August Sanders, and in the way of a formal aspect to kind of, you know, uh, my community deserves to be photographed in this beautiful, um, and raised above what people and what these societies think of, you know, when they think of Boyle Heights and when they think of the larger aspect of East Los Angeles and on also um, South Central where a lot of my family ended up having to migrate because Boyle Heights has been getting priced out and gentrified for about 10 years, longer than that. Like I was born and raised in Boyle Heights. And then uh, even my own family, we got priced out when I was 16 and then we had to go to East LA and then we moved back to Boyle Heights. So, you know, there's all these things going on. So the project kind of started because I went to New York and because I got radicalized there, um, realizing like all these, uh, you know, racist notions. And, you know, I was a documentarian and then, you know, I trained myself to become a portrait photographer. Like I didn't, had no interest in it. So, you know, these portraits that I started to photograph about 10 years ago, I mean, four years ago, but I've been a photographer for more than 10 years, um, started with that idea. And it was kind of like a fuck you to the establishment. But the longer I continued, it became a love letter. It became a love letter to my community. And, you know, e almost all these portraits, there's 10 in the slideshow, there was 12 in the solo exhibition I had. Um, they're all, you know, they understand what's going on. I am totally open with everybody that I find, a, almost everybody is a stranger. I do an interview with them. It's usually from 30 minutes to two hours. Um, they get a portrait and they're really open about that they want to be seen. Like uh, at the time that these were two, the two of the youngest people I photographed. And so um, this is Georgie, and she's a fourth generation Mexican American. And she really understood the identity of like, like my family kind of fell apart um, through every generation, um, kind of chasing this idea of the American dream. And when I met her, it was through an online call. So I went through the internet and Instagram and trying to find people. And, and she just started to tell me, like, I understand it. My family fell apart too. How do you continue to dream, um, you know, bigger or even continue to dream about chasing this facade of the American dream when you're a fourth generation Mexican American, you're living in poverty and your grandparents or your great grandparents kind of achieved it and then your family and your parents have kind of lost it. And whereas opposed, I juxtaposed it in the exhibition, Juan, who is first generation uh, Mexican American from Boyle Heights, whose parents came and he still believes in it, you know, and they're within the same scene, the punk scene, um, which is a subculture. 
And he's still like, yeah, like I'm trying to achieve the American dream because my family really hasn't. So it's interesting being able to find these people and being able to, you know, share these stories. Um, because Boyle Height, although gentrification and all these things, and, you know, like Judy was saying, like there's all these stories. And like, um, like I got to meet one of my favorite idols, which is Graciela y Tubre. I always say her name like really messed up because I can't speak Spanish. Um, like she was like talking, she saw these pictures and she's like, cholos. Um, but we're so much more than that. You know, it's, we're in contemporary times and, and there's so much more history than that. And so I'm so interested in telling contemporary stories. And a lot of you guys are photographers and you're going to tell stories that I don't even know about, you know, because I'm like 29. I'm not old, but you know what I mean? Like, you know much more than what I'll know. And so, like, with these stories, you know, like, I want to be able to tell more than what, you know, the media and what everybody thinks we're just about. And so this is what I've been pursuing for the past four years. And... Um, and yeah, and, and this is a couple, and this is somebody I went to school with, and that has been largely marginalized, and this is what I'll end on. I went to school with Ruby, and I went to school with Ruby, who's on the left, since we were 10. And, um, you know, I found photography, and unfortunately she didn't. You know, she grew up trans, and she grew up trans in Boyle Heights before there was any type of movement and you know the school system failed her and she had to drop out of school because she was scared that you know by the time she got to high school she would get killed and so i was able to find her years later when i came back from new york and after my my undergraduate and she's alive but she you know the way she describes her existence is that she's surviving you know, and so there's these t stories of, you know, Boyle Heights and just being able to survive. And so when I talk to people and they're so interested in all these narratives of Boyle Heights and wanting to gentrification and, you know, what do you think about like these politics and everything like that? And I'm like, I'm interested in talking to people that are just trying to survive sometimes. Some of us are just trying to survive each day, you know, and for Ruby, She's just trying to survive, and she has her protector, which is her boyfriend, you know? And so for me, like, as a humanist, I'm a photographer, but I'm a humanist first, you know? And my, my agency as a woman and an intersectional photographer is this, you know, to always remember, like, to, you know, stay true to myself and to tell stories, but also to remember that, like, to just, stay true to yourself and to always remember that like your subject is still like a human and that they're not they're not supposed to be exploited because you know a lot of you guys will go on to universities and they'll tell you all these things but a lot of them are exploitative practices and I'm not interested in that you know so just remember that you know that to stay true to yourself and what your what your family teaches you so thank you thank you star oh, yeah. <laughs> Next, we will have Genevieve Gagnard, who is an artist that uses character performance, self-portraiture, and sculptures to explore blackness, whiteness, femininity, class, and intersections therein. Her work confronts viewers with the powers and anxieties of intersectional identity. She positions her own body as the chief site of exploration and blends humor, persona, and popular culture to reveal how contrasting realities can feel like displacement. She has exhibited throughout the United States, including shows at the Cabin LA in Los Angeles and the Flag Art Foundation in New York. Welcome, Genevieve. Thank you. So um, I make work about my mixed race identity. And um, so my mom is white, my dad is black. And so this is a result of that. <laughs> uh, this is a portrait I made of my parents. Um, you can't really tell, but my mom has her pajamas underneath that dress. And I made some gold chains from some Home Depot chains at uh, Home Depot. Um, and this is an old picture of me from the fifth grade um, that I kind of stumbled across years later. And kind of, it was like a, a telling uh, photograph for what I make today. 
Um, so I dress up as different characters to talk about my mixed race identity. We navigate through the world how others see us usually, and I pass as white, but I identify as a woman of color. Um, so I'm playing with stereotypes and kind of showing people that um, we kind of put judgments on people, but we don't know their whole story. I also try and um, talk to talk about um, how we um, don't fit the ideal of what we see in the media. I also work in installation to kind of add a, add to the story. So you're going into these installations that kind of give you clues about my mixed race identity. I photograph here in Los Angeles. I also photograph in Massachusetts where I'm from originally. And in my photographs, I hope that young women will see themselves in a positive light. Um, since I don't fit that ideal that they can kind of see themselves in that and kind of um, see themselves as beautiful um, and push beyond the stereotypes. I have a lot of slides, sorry. Um, so as I was saying, I, I work in installation. Um, I work with found objects um, to kind of play with history and um, popular culture. Um, so here is an installation of hand mirrors to kind of talk about the, the history of the selfie. Um, so my dad is from New Orleans and I'm working on a project right now that um, um, is gonna be opening in November. And um, I was able to go there and photograph um, all new characters um, to really delve into the history of um, my dad's history. And I'm ending on two images that are from this new body of work. So photographing in, in in a place that was kind of new to me. I went I went to New Orleans um, as a child like a few times, but I didn't have a real sense of the place. So going there and like working in these really um, hot, sticky terrain and referencing history more. And this last image is the base of um, a Jefferson Davis monument that has been since taken down. He was a Confederate um, leader and uh, slave owner. So I wanted to kind of bring a uh, new um, presence here and kind of owning that this no longer exists. Um, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Genevieve. Um, our final panelist is Marisabel Perez, who is 17 years old and is currently attending the University of California, Irvine. She was born and raised in a historic South Central area in South Los Angeles. As much as she loved living in South LA, if she were to live anywhere in the world, she would live in her dad's native land, Santa Maria de Jesus, Guatemala. Throughout her life, she has encountered in love and learned to love distinct cultures. She is passionate about projects that will result in the uplifting in, of her community. Marisabel is inspired by youth activists who demonstrate that change comes from, comes from within. She wants to pursue a career in political science and eventually, venture, and eventually venture into the nonprofit and political sector. With this, she hopes to illuminate South LA from the shadows and make it a great place for future generations to come. Let's welcome Marisabel. Hey everyone, so my name is Marisabel. I'm 17 years old. I'm a freshman at UC Irvine. And I have been with those photos for the past two years, so that's how I really like grew as a photographer, I guess. Um, this is one of my pictures. Um, this was for the Esta Soy Yo project that was last year. Um, through this picture, um, I really wanted to highlight me as a person and just South Central. This is actually a mural on South Central. It's of Emiliano Zapata, 
led the Mexican Revolution. So because I am half Mexican and half Guatemalan, I figured that this was a way for me to just demonstrate my identity and as a first generation, um, just demonstrate that I'm so proud of where our, my parents are from and I take pride in you know, their, their culture and their background. And this picture was taken at the 25th or that the LA, um, it was a march and rally for the LA riots. And if none of you are really familiar with what's going on, um, South Central, um, Boyle Heights, and just like a lot of LA is currently being gentrified. So you see a lot of these like, we buy houses cash fast, um, trying to displace our community, trying to displace people of color. And so that's something that I'm really passionate about. Like I. I hate gentrification. I hate um, seeing, you know, like the local businesses being torn down. So that's something that I really try to focus on. Um, we currently had we had an exhibit um, called City Rising, and I this you'll see a lot of my photographs up here. Um, some of which were at the exhibit, and it just focused on gentrification and a lot of girls from South Central Boyle Heights um, documenting their communities and documenting it as through the, like, the changes of gentrification and just demonstrating our culture um, prior to gentrification and just seeing like different the differences. Um, so this was another picture that I took. And South Central is known for like, you know, um, the Cholo culture or just like, it's like um, South Central, there's like a lot of um, black and brown folks. So this was um, at the March and Rally as well. And the guys from like the cars, they were actually really nice. Like they were interested in we were, what we were photographing. They started asking us questions of, you know, um, just the whole project. So that was, and this is another picture from the March and Rally. <coughs> this was, um, I don't, you can't really tell from this picture, but she was actually a dancer and um, she was actually carrying her baby. And that day it was really, really hot. Like it was really, really hot. and. We didn't realize, um, a whole bunch of the girls from the project and I went, and we didn't realize she was carrying a baby until like we saw like his little head just, you know, just coming out. And it's just crazy that she, we were all like complaining how hot it was. And like as a mother, it was soaring like her resilience and just her power as a mom, carrying her baby and just showing him the coat or her, the culture and you know, um, just trying to integrate the, the baby basically. Um, this was also at the March and Rally. This was a little girl. Um, during the March, yeah, there was, um, they were playing music and she just caught my eye because she was just dancing to the music. And, uh, you know, it just, I just really felt like photographing her. Um, so yeah. uh, this is by downtown Los Angeles. Uh, this was an American apparel factory. Um, I had family members that would work there and it got shut down. And now, I photographed this because it's actually like in the process of being made into like a mall and like apartments, like luxury apartments. And it's like in the middle of like just like uh like factories and stuff. So like it's just, you know, gentrification at its finest. But yeah, I just felt like photographing that. And this woman actually, I was just um emailing her the other day. We were um I met her at Mariachi Plaza with my friend. We were photographing and she was she's obviously a mariachi. And she was telling us, like, we started talking to her, having a conversation with her. And she said that she immigrated to this country specifically to be a mariachi in Mariachi Plaza because she saw this place as somewhere with, like, a lot of opportunities. But recently, she's, like, the, the job load has been going down. And she was just telling us, like, how it's really affecting her. And it's, like, affecting the, commun the mariachi community at Mariachi Plaza. But I really loved her because... She was just, she just demonstrated her strength. She like told us like, I haven't found a job, but I'm a strong woman and I'll find a job. Um, I'm persistent. And it just really felt like something, I felt, I felt really like happy photographing her. And I emailed her her pictures recently and she was so happy. Like, she was like, oh, I thought you were never gonna get back to me. I thought it was just, oh, you come photograph me and that's it. But like, I promised her, I was like, I, I promise I'll send you your pictures. And she was really happy with that. And this was another man at Mariachi, um, at the Mariachi Plaza. 
And he didn't have his, like, tie. And, like, his friends were, like, bugging him for it. They were, like, you know, if you're going to take pictures, you can't look all, like, like this. You got to look very fancy for the pictures. So then he, like, got in his, in his like, mode or whatever. And, yeah, I just, I just really loved, like, the whole, um, I guess, like, the bond that the Monachis have and, like, this, like, ability to, like, stay together, even through, like, the hard times. You know, they were, like, just waiting for, like, something to come up for them. But, like, at the same time, they were having a good time and spending time with their friends. And this was actually one of my favorite pictures. I took this in South Central, where I'm from. And this man, like, he's, like, my favorite man. Like, he passes by my house every Sunday. And um, I always, like, buy ice cream. Like, I don't buy ice cream from anybody else that isn't him. So he's, like, you know, he's, like, part of the community. And I chose this picture um, to highlight especially recent events, you know, street vendors being attacked for being street vendors. And that's, like, that's, they're just street vendors. Just, you know, they're part of the community. And I felt like I had, I, I felt the need to honor him as a street vendor, but most more than anything as a human, because that's what he is. And often, you know, they're looked down upon because, oh, they street, you know, they, they have, or they live off of street vending, and they just, they're not respected. And this is someone I respect, and this is someone, you know, I care about. And as a community member, I I wouldn't want him to, like, get his stuff taken away just because he's a street vendor. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Now for the Q&A portion of tonight's event, I will ask our panelists questions about their work and how their personal experiences have defined them as artists. Afterwards, we will have a brief Q&A so that the audience members can submit their own questions for the panelists. To ask a question, please jot down your question on the index card that you provided at the registration table. And before the second to last question, I will ask you to pass those cards down the aisle so we can collect them and I will read those questions out loud. Now, without further ado, let's begin the Q&A portion of tonight's panel. This question is for, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this question is for um, Marisabel. How did you come to a point where you learned to embrace yourself and your art at the same period? What challenges were the hardest for you to overcome? So I, prior to Las Fotos Project, I wasn't a photographer. Like, I wouldn't call myself a photographer. I mean, yeah, I would take pictures with the little development ones, like where you would actually have to go to a store to have them develop. Like growing up, like that was it. But um, Las Fotos Project really helped me grow as a person and as a photographer because even I saw my personal growth, like through photography from the first semester, which was SSOYO, it was just um, self portraits and just different ways to like different aspects of like yourself. Like the first picture I showed. Um, and then this next project that I was part in, the gentrification, the City Rising project, which focused on gentrification, it really showed me that you can tell a story through photography. And you know, it's like cliche, you know, like pictures, like you know, say a thousand words or whatever. And I never really understood that until I came about this project because these are community members, and just I grew in the sense that I was able to tell stories through my photography. And I love being at like the exhibit and having people like talk among, amongst themselves and say like their own ideas or like, oh, this is what I think about this picture. And I just I love the the idea it brings of like uniting people and having them come, you know, through the arts, just um, I guess talk and just unite. So. Thank you, Genevieve. Um. In our current time, what do you think it means to be a radical girl or woman? And do you consider yourself a radical woman? And if so, how? I don't, I think I'm a radical woman in training. <laughs> I feel like I'm surrounded by radical women and I'm really inspired to be here. Um, but I don't know if I, I think I'm constantly struggling with that. Um, uh, and I think some days maybe I, feel like I'm that I embody that more than um, other days um, sorry what was the first part of that question um, <clears throat> in our current time what do you think it means to be a radical girl or woman I think just um, uh, standing up and standing out about you know your beliefs and if you have a message that betters the community and uh, just like being fearless I guess Thank you. Um, now, Star, do you consider yourself a feminist? 
What challenges do you face as a feminist that are particular to the Latinx community? Yeah, I think it took me a really long time to consider myself um, a feminist because I felt like feminism didn't apply to me, but then I felt like it was mostly like white feminism. Um, but then, like, I really, like, got really in touch with, like, Chicano feminism, and so now it's not like that. I just think I'm a Chicano feminist. I feel like I'm more of an intersectional feminist. And so, um, yeah, so I really consider myself to be, like, an intersectional feminist. Um, and can you ask this first part of the... Of course. Um, well, what challenges do you face as a feminist that are particular to the Latinx community? Um, I would say, I, I would just say challenges that are particular to women of color is just, just saying, not being, not being submissive and not, like, not acting like you're not a woman of color. I think it's very easily, it's very easy for the dominant culture or dominant art culture to kind of want you to act like you're not a woman of color um, but at least for me and my practice that would go against my ethics um, and I'm very vocal about that especially coming from Boyle Heights and coming from Boyle Heights when is a place that was marginalized and disenfranchised um, so I'm always very vocal as somebody of color and as an intersectional feminist um, that I talk to, like, I don't know, whenever I give workshops and stuff like that, to, like, be proud of wherever you come from, or if you're a feminist, or if you're intersectional, or even if you're struggling with all that, to not be ashamed, and don't let anybody be ash uh, shame you for that, especially when you're younger. I think that's the hardest part, is that when you're young, people can make you feel ashamed of it, all of that, to be ashamed of your color or your circumstances, um, but not to be ashamed of that, you know, that it's okay, whatever's happened to you, you know, and to be proud of that, and that you can overcome it, but not overcome it and forget it in that way. So I feel like that's what uh, the struggle is, to not kind of be quiet about that. Thank you. Now for Judy. What, when did you know that this is what you wanted to do, that you wanted to pursue art, and can you describe or explain, elaborate on your inspiration for art. And what was the last part? And can you describe your inspiration for art? Uh, <clears throat> I think actually I, I knew that I was an artist. Maybe I wouldn't have called it that. I, I think I, I never felt, even as I went through art school, that I had the right to call myself an artist. Because for, first of all, there was nobody that I could look at that was looked like me or came from where I came from that was an artist. So I guess I wasn't one. You know, I was just this thing that, you know, painted, I painted, <laughs> you know, but I wasn't an artist. And um, and in fact, the news, when they first started writing about my work and paying attention to me, it was, they called me a gang member, one of, <laughs> that I was a gang member. I mean, I guess I kind of looked like the kids when I was really young and I was working with the kids, and, and or they thought I was a, they, they called me everything, uh, you know, uh, urban um, planner, urban gang worker. I mean, no one would say, utter the words artist. And then at some point, actually, in developing my own agency, I said, you know, I am an artist. And I started painting in kindergarten when I didn't speak English. And I the teacher was smart enough to set me aside with little silver cans of temper color and I began to paint. And that's how I began to communicate. And then I started, by third grade, I started talking about the paintings. Hmm. So I was speaking English. But I think visual arts, or for me, art is a form of communication and it was my form from the very beginning. Thank you. At this time, I want to ask you to please pass your cards to the end of the aisle so that the ushers can come and collect them. Now, the final question of this portion of the Q&A, um, I want to ask all of you, what life advice would you have given yourself when you were about our age and learning to feel empowered as a woman? What advice do you think you have for young women pursuing an arts in a male-dominated industry? In a what kind of industry? 
male dominated. Oh, in a male dominated. <laughs> Shall I start? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, <clears throat> advice. You know, it's easy to give advice, but each of you are coming from your own particular circumstance. You know, your own, you have your own families, you have, for me, my, you know, I, I pointed to my grandmother being a person who taught me to pay attention to my dreams. You know, we'd come to breakfast in the morning and she'd say, what did you dream? And so I knew that that other reality, the reality that was kind of in the ether, the, the subconscious, was significant and that it might tell me something about the time I'm living right now. And then she would use it as a cautionary note. She would say, well, okay, you, you dreamt that you had a wreck. I don't think you should drive today. <laughs> she was like, she would tell me that it was, and I didn't like it because I thought, I was afraid to tell her my dream sometimes because I thought it would be restrictive. She would <laughs> tell me I couldn't do something. However, my advice to you is that from the circumstances of your very own life, every moment is about you dreaming about what you could be and where you can go. And the male-dominated society that you live in is subversive in the sense that you don't even begin to identify it. You don't really understand it. It takes a while for you to begin to read it and say, is this an idea I have about myself or is it somebody else's idea? Mm -hmm. And that's really the hardest thing to do. What, what is my idea? And I just want to say that that little, that space between imagining and making it be real is not as far apart as you think. I guess one other thing, like, because I started doing photography when I was like 16, and um, I was unlucky enough for a program like this to exist. Um, I started going to East LA College, and all my professors were like, old v veterans from like Vietnam who became art teachers because of the GI Bill. So they were all crazy. <laughs> like, um, and all white guys from like the Midwest. Um, and like the same thing, they would look at my pictures and say like, why do you like to photograph gang members? And it was like all punk rockers, you know? So in the same way, um, but like for me, I was kind of always radical. Like if my mom would say, your mouth's gonna get you in trouble, you just need to learn to shut up. And I would say, why? Like, you know what I mean? But like, I feel like sometimes it's okay not to shut up. You know, it's okay to say like, kind of like, fuck you, you know? And like, especially in college, like a lot of times like your professors will make it seem and I'm in graduate school, you know, so I'm still in school. But like, especially an undergraduate, your professor is not always right. And a lot of times they have their own shit and they have their own issues, and especially in art school. Um, so I would say like, don't believe them. You know what I mean? Like, do your own research, don't believe them. You know what I mean? Like. If follow your heart sounds like corny, but it but it is very true. Like if I believed everything my professors said, I wouldn't be here. You know, and that that's the truth. You know, I I never I always had such like a punk spirit that I never believed any of my professors. I kept doing exactly what I wanted. You know what I mean from the beginning, and I always talked back. You know what I mean, which drove my mom crazy, but it got me here. You know, so in that way, like I was always like wanted to be radical. And so in the like, that's the thing is like, you can have like a loving experience or you can always just say like ethics establishment, like do good in school, do all that. But you can always say like, they're wrong, you know, or maybe they'll get you, you know, like look for other mentors, look for other people of color. You know what I mean? Look for outside of that, like try to find, those allies, you know, because it's hard, you know, don't give up. But at the same time, same time, don't also believe them. So. I was just going to add that, um, like, when I was younger, I wasn't encouraged to be an artist. I wasn't, 
told that what I was doing I could like move forward and keep doing so it took me a long time so if you're passionate about something just like stay focused on that goal and um like you were saying look for other mentors look for people that will kind of um just reassure you that you can do this and um you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish so really quick I'm I'm around your guys' age I don't are you guys in high school are you girls in high school no <laughs> okay, so I'm around, I'm like seven, I'm still 17, so like I don't really have advice, advice, but like join programs, join, you know, it, it really helps. Like I, at first I was like, you know, how am I just gonna go just take pictures of you know stuff? Like that's weird, but like join programs, like it really helps you grow as a person. And I really like Las Fotos Project really did a lot for me, and I thank them so much. Like I love Las Fotos Project. Um, so just join, join stuff. If you don't like it, well, then you could always, you know, let it go. But, you know, just put yourself out there and really explore. I just want to say I got a D in painting. Yeah, exa <laughs> ex exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I want to thank you all for responding. Uh, now this time I'll ask you this. <laughs> at this time I'll ask you um, one of the questions that we got from our audience. It's pretty open-ended. Now this is addressed to all of you. Do you want your work to change your community within, or do you want to focus more on changing the perspective of your community? I'd say both. Yeah, yeah, I, was gonna say, I, was like, Can you say both? I mean, you don't have to do one or the other. I, I want people not to see people. You know, first of all, I, I want it to be not ashamed of where I came from. I mean, I think you when you were saying that, it's like, Okay, I, I was born at 85th and Central, yeah. okay? And yes, yeah, that's the place where two riots occurred, mm -hmm. right? It's a place where there's a tremendous amount of violence. Mm -hmm. And today, there's a school name for me there. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The Judy Baca Arts Academy. And there's little kids who are going to, who are thinking about themselves as being artists, hmm. right? So that was it. I think we want to change the way people perceive our communities because we are the gems that come from them. And the other is we want to be able to change the people we live and work with and people we love so that they understand the complexity and the deepness and the importance of what we do as artists. Yeah, I, I would agree. Like, um, when I had my show of this work, um, I always said, like, the most inspiring day was I got to do like this all day workshop with um, this um, after school program called 826 and it had kids from 8 to 16 and and there was like these um, you know brown kids because they you know they're not just Mexican but like you know from everywhere you know so Latinx kids and um, and there was this really shy boy, and he read um, Juan's picture, and, and Juan, you know, every all of them have paragraphs, and Juan uh, in the caption said that I had messed up the picture, and then the twice, and then the, the, the film messed up, and, and then like, I took four times to photograph Juan, and, and but, it, but Juan just kept saying yes, because that he wanted to be seen, he wanted, for it to be a part of the project because he wanted people to know that he existed, which was like, I ended the show on that portrait, which was very optimistic, you know? And the little boy said like, I like that, that he looks like me and, and I like that and it, and it makes me think about myself because he wants to know people know he exists. And like, it was so hard for me not to cry because that the little boy saw like himself in a museum, you know, and so it's like, it it changed something about him, and he wrote a little poem, and you know, it was all that. But like, you know, for me, I've always said like I, I like Latinx kids got to see versions of themselves in a museum, like you know, through visual representation of photos, you know, and and it wasn't that far from downtown, so it hits all the areas where the museum was, and and it's so close to Boyle Heights, so. For me, yeah, it changes the perception of Boyle Heights, but then at the same time, some people from Boyle Heights are like, yeah, like these pictures are in a museum. So it, it was so beautiful, like, you know, so it's like, eh, people are gonna think we're gonna think, but you know, everybody being so excited about the pictures being in a museum, that was like, 
the greatest feeling, you know, it's like, so it's like both, but then like those moments I hold so dear, you know. Um, with that said, I want to give a special thanks to our panelists, Judy, Starr, Genevieve, and Marisabel. I want to thank you so much for coming tonight and sharing your work, your thoughts, and your experiences. Um, with that said, we invite you to stay to look at the Radical Woman exhibit to learn more about these wonderful women. And for more information about Las Fotos Project and our programming, visit lasfotosproject.org. Thank you. Okay, before you head out, um, just a quick uh, announcement, uh, clearly an adjustment to the schedule. Since we started late, we did end late here, and we're going to make up the time. Each of the sessions will still be 40 minutes. Um, so what we'll do to the agenda is we'll start at 3 for the first breakout session, 3 to um, to 3.40 will be the first breakout session. Then we'll do just a quick five minute break. And then we'll do the second session following that for 40 minutes and then we'll cut into the reception. So if you haven't already signed up for your breakout session, please do so just outside of the Billy Wilder Theater. Thank you so much. <laughs>